Good afternoon, class. Welcome to the dead word list. Now, the dead word list is something you've already seen in your previous classes, but I want to go over it in detail as how it applies to my class. Not only did I start this with the other teachers and the rest of the English department, um, because I am the English department chair, but I started it specifically with the AP classes with the intention of elevating your usage of language. I'm trying to elevate it more to a usage of formal language, more professional, less slang, less what you would use on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and in your text messaging. So we're taking it to that upper level so that what you're writing actually works and fits for the AP test, but also what you're writing works in a more academic, more professional world because that is where you're headed. You're headed to college, you're headed into a professional environment, so you need to have that idea of that professional writing. Now the dead word list will be shared with you. If you go to Google Classroom, you will notice that it is already shared along with the video on your uh, Google Classroom stream. I highly suggest that you not only save it, but that you print it out. You can use this in my class on the first, couple, first I think, two tests and maybe the first essay we do in class. So I will let you use it most of the first month of the class. But keeping that in mind, you can't use it from your phone. You can't use it from your computer or your iPad. It has to be from a printout. Plus, it's just better if you have it printed and ready to go. So going through this, um, this is from now on an all written assignments, typed, handwritten, computerized, typewritten, any of those apply, okay? any assignment, homework, classwork, blogs, tests, quizzes, essays, and you will learn about all of those different types of assignments and how they apply within the class as we move on. Okay, so going through this, the first one we're going to look at is this idea of contractions. This you're used to. This is easy. Ms. Patil has already had you doing this. You understand the idea of not using a contraction. Make sure though that you're spelling out the, con the word correctly so that you understand what word it actually is. Cannot is one of those that could actually be used with either it squished together or separate. Either is correct, so you are fine on that. But remembering that we're spelling it out the full word. We're taking away the abbreviation. Okay, any number under 100. Most people are used, to, are used to any number under 10, but the idea and the easiest way to remember it the way that I was taught and that I'll teach you is that any number that is can be done in one word should be spelled out. Any number that takes more than one word write out in numerical form. So keeping this in mind, 100 is the first word that requires two words the first number that requires two words. 21 is 20 hyphen one, so it's technically one word. All numbers, the, once you get into the 20 and the, you get like 21, 22, 23, 31, 33, those are all hyphenated numbers. So technically it's one word. Okay, the exceptions are percentages, decimal points, full dates, fractions, or money. Full dates are an exception as long as it has the month in it. Okay, what I mean by this is, oh, we're going to do this on the 7th. Well, the 7th of what? So you have to put in the full date. You don't necessarily have to put in the year, but we're going to do this on July 7th. Then you could actually have the number. If you put in the full year, as in July 7th, 2017, then you also will uh, include the numerical form there as well. Fractions uh, do not get spelled out. Money, as long as you're, because it's a decimal point and you're putting the money symbol there, then it doesn't need to be spelled out. If you're just saying, hey, we had $50 and you're not putting the number sign, then it should be spelled out. Percentage is the same thing because of the, the percentage sign going there, it works there. Abbreviations, all abbreviations, main ones, etc., LOL, the ampersand, B slash C, versus. I reserve the right to add abbreviations to this as we go throughout the year. You will notice that this is a flexible working document. I will, because this document is shared with you and you have access to it, there will be at times where I add things to it or I ask one of you to add something to the document etc. or etc. should be spelled out. In fact, I prefer that you don't even use the word in general because if you're listing in your sentence, we like apples, bananas, pears, comma, etc. 
that comma, etc. means you can't remember the end of your thoughts. So you're still thinking. I don't want you to still be thinking. I want your thoughts to be complete and in one place. So keeping that in mind, we just take out the etc. and it looks like your thought is complete, even though it might not necessarily be that way. The LOL um, and the B slash C are text speak. So anything that fits into the text speak realm is not allowed. Ampersand is an abbreviation for and. Spell out the word and. It is easier to spell out the word and than it is to write an ampersand. Verses or VS, spell out the word versus. And versus is not a verb. We versed for Ryan. No, we didn't verse for Ryan. We played for Ryan. Okay? Exceptions include commonly accepted ones that we use in society. Doctor, Mr., Mrs., Mrs., AM, and PM should have the periods in them and they should be capital. BC and AD, same thing with the periods and the all capital. Um, pronouns. So we have two aspects of pronouns here the you, your, your, yours, yourself, and yourselves. We're not talking at someone, we're not saying, hey, you go do this. We're not getting someone involved in the conversation. If they're reading your essay, we know that they're already involved in the conversation. So you don't need to make them feel dumb or stupid or idiotic by saying, hey, you, they know it's them. Okay, so instead of writing, you might be wondering, you make it more open to where it's any reader. So one may wonder, the reader may wonder, the analyzer may wonder, the athletes may wonder. Okay, the same thing goes for no first person pronouns. This includes I, we, us, our, or my. Unless I am asking for your specific opinion, you are not allowed to put I. I know it's your opinion, but you don't need to say in my opinion. You don't need to say I feel or I think. I know you feel, I know you think, I know you have an opinion. Just write it. You don't need to give me the, the side chatter about it. Just get right to the point and it strengthens your writing the less pronouns you use or the less personal pronouns you use. Okay, phrases. This is again with the not limited to. There are some that I put some extra ones on here. In conclusion, you end your essay, or your last paragraph of your essay with in conclusion, I will cross it out and probably even cross out your entire conclusion paragraph. I am going to talk about, this includes my paper is going to be about, I am going to tell you about, you were not in sixth grade anymore. You were juniors and seniors in AP English classes. What you are going to write about is in your thesis statement. Your thesis statement is your roadmap. Your introduction leads your thesis statement. That tells me what you're going to talk about. You need don't need to say, in my essay, I'm going to talk about my th three favorite fruits, which are, no, just get right to the point. Have you ever? Rhetorical questions don't belong necessarily in an AP style essay. So have you ever wondered this? Have you ever wondered that? Have you ever thought that? Those are rhetorical questions. Get them out of your brain and out of your thoughts with that relation to how you're structuring and writing your essays. I think, and in my opinion, go along with the idea of the no usage of first person pronouns. Okay, so we're not, and again, I know it's your opinion, so you don't need to tell me that. In the beginning of the novel, which also goes in the resolution of the novel, oh, and this should also go in the end of the novel, was the other one I wanted in there. Um, so keeping this in mind, this phrase is so overused. So don't tell me in the beginning of the novel. Instead, say things like, at the beginning, the author does this. We know it's a novel. We know it's a short story. We know it's an essay. And you don't even need to say at the beginning. You could say the author begins with or the author starts with. So change your phrasing and your wording around so it sounds better. In the book, throughout the novel. They're the same thing. And instead of using in the book or throughout the novel, give me the name of it. So in The Great Gatsby. In A Streetcar Named Desire. In I am Malala. So you're actually stating and naming and you're being more specific. If you haven't noticed yet, everything I'm giving you here is with this idea of being more specific. The more specific you are, the more you own your words and you own your language. And that's what I want you to do is I want you to write with that elevated aspect. 
the last phrase I have here for now, there will, like I said, there will be other phrases that are, get added to this. And I, in fact, you'll notice that the list is a little different if you've seen this before because I have added them um, this summer. Right off the bat, it's overused. It's what we would call trite. Trite is probably one of our vocabulary words this year for this idea of being overused and this idea of not being commonplace anymore. It's because it's just too much in society. So when you use a phrase or a cliche like right off the bat, it it makes your language feel uneducated and at a lower level. And again, I don't want that for you. Okay, the last part. This is where the students have the hardest problem. All slang, overused, and vague words are all dead. There is a huge list here. Okay, we're going to do an activity in class with these words and helping you to focus and get get other words into your vocabulary on what to use and how to make it different so that you have an idea of what can be different in your writing. But you are no longer ever, 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 ever allowed to use these words in your writing. With grading, I do this a little differently than most teachers. You are allowed four grammatical spelling and dead word mistakes. So it could be two grammatical, one spelling, and one dead word, but that fifth one costs you a point on that test or that essay or that homework assignment. So you will notice me circling things throughout, and so every five circles cost you a point. You can have nine circles and that's still only one point, but as soon as you get to ten, that's now two points off your essay or your, or your test or whatever we're working on that time. So it behooves you to know the dead word list. It behooves you to have great spelling and it behooves you to make sure that you have great grammar. And grammar we will cover um, this year in abundance. Notice there I changed my word because I was about to say a lot, but I didn't. Okay, so um, the words here, there are many words. Again, that's a dead word, so, and so is so. Um, in your speaking, it's fine to use these. It's more the idea of if you are using them in your writing. And we're getting away from the vague. I want you to be specific. I want you to name things. So instead of saying these go together, anybody, everybody, and somebody. Instead of using those three, say anyone, everyone, someone. Body just adds that lower level to the words itself. So and the same thing here, I noticed another one here, nobody. Now another aspect here, things that are bad and things that are good. How bad are they and how good are they? So if something's just good, then it doesn't deserve to have an adjective attached to it. How good is it? Is it stupendous? Is it superfluous? Is it spectacular? Okay, if it's bad, is it horrible, is it morose, is it disgusting? They have different degrees and different levels. Other ones down here, stuff and thing. Instead of saying, oh, I like that stuff or I like those things, what is that stuff? What is that thing? Okay, I liked those books. I liked the language that the author was using. I liked the stuffed animals. Now, these give students a hard time. The get, getting, go, going, gone, and gonna. And they also fit with the got, gotta, gotten. So we don't get things. Get is that lower elevated word there. So instead of getting something or going something, how are you getting there? Or how are you going there? Are you dancing? Are you twirling? Are you driving? Are you walking? Are you jogging? Being more specific. The th same things with the little and the big they how big how small the other ones here that i just added this year repetition pedantic and plethora pedantic and plethora look like they would be great words to use they look like they are ap level words but let me tell you i was an ap reader this summer for the ap language test and every single essay i read had that word in it and as a reader when i'm reading 100 to 200 essays a day in a 10 hour period it becomes overused with every single essay using it so we're going to come up with new words to go along with that okay 
So make sure that you have this with you because you can use it on your first test. Print it out and bring it with you to class. One of your assignments today is uh, for homework is I want you to pick out 10 of the words and on the paper itself I want you to write five different words. Don't, uh, yes, use thesaurus.com if you want to, but don't use the first five. Use different ones because of what we're going to do with the words. Again, 10 words, pick 10, write five synonyms for them. Have a great night and I will see you in class tomorrow.